Alright, so tell your full issue. I'm Rebecca Fosh, and I'm the president of the Illinois Mycological Association, but today I'm here at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. And you love it here, don't you? I love it. This is my favorite week out of the year. I brought my six-year-old daughter, my 72-year-old father, and I love that the festival is just multiple generations getting out to celebrate ecology and mushrooms from a culinary perspective. I love the emphasis this year on fungi as medicine. I've been reading a lot of research studies about mushrooms and cancer by a friend who's in hospice, and he was given only 10 months to live 10 years ago. And we think that one of the reasons that he's had so much longevity beyond what doctors anticipated was he got in touch with a medicinal mushroom company called Aloha Medicinals. And he's been taking turkey tail mushrooms, which are one of the best proven mushrooms in extending the lifespan and reversing and preventing cancer. So he's been on a very aggressive program with turkey tails, which is, you know, um, was complementary medicine to the chemo and radiation that he underwent. And the mushrooms have no bad side effects, and there's no reason so much shouldn't use them when they're undergoing traditional treatments as well. And we're just really glad to have them around. And I've been listening in all the sessions I've been attending to see if I can pick up any more facts or information that I can bring home to him. Now let me ask you about the session. So you have a four-day festival. What exactly is going on day to day? Define it. Well, my days here start with a foray in the morning where you go out with an expert guide who knows the topography of the area. And they also know any species that you want to pick. To most people, this is the most common mushroom that they know. This is a Garicus spice forest, so the white button mushroom. This is what you'll see sliced up in a salad bar or something like that. But there are so many other wonderful gourmet mushrooms that you can find here in the mountains of Colorado. And the two most important things to learn are the um, edible species and the couple of poisonous ones. And then, once you become an expert on those, it's fun to learn everything in between. So let me show you what I've been cooking. Okay, let's okay. say. So your interest is also culinary. Yes. Yes, yes. Although I'm an urban wildlife manager in my career, one of my hobbies is gourmet food. So I do a little bit of menu chefing for four and five star restaurants in the Chicago region. And I teach them how to incorporate more mushrooms into their menus. So this is one of my favorite mushrooms. It's called Lactarius deliciosa. And when I Lactarius deliciosa. Yes, and that deliciosa can tell you something really key about it. It's delicious. So when I'm in the woods and I take my pocket knife, I'm going to cut the stem like that. And you see that orange ring? It bleeds an orange ring around it. That's how you can tell that it's Lactarius deliciosa. And you can see that the gills also stain that kind of greenish color. Well, I take these home and I wash them and I slice them into ribbons. And I think that people use too much fat when they cook mushrooms. So when I work with chefs, I have a steam searing technique where I start them off in a pan and I sweat them. You sweat the I fruit. sweat them. So I put about maybe, oh, a quarter of an inch of water in the pan and I'm going to put the lid on and I'm going to let them steam in that water in a saute pan. Then I'm going to take the lid off, add a tiny bit of fat, just like a pat of butter, or if you want them vegetarian or vegan, you can use coconut oil. You're making Yeah, good. I, I come over for dinner, I'll make you some Lactarius deliciosa. So then, once all the water has evaporated back into the mushroom, if you were to pour that water off, you'd lose all that flavor and nutrition. So I evaporate that water back into the mushroom. That fat is in there to for glycation to sort of caramelize the edges of the mushroom. Glycation. You cook them down. Mushrooms are what the Japanese call having a fist taste, which is umami. It's a savory, meat-like taste. Yeah. So we want to cook our mushrooms in a way that maximizes that. Maximize the umami. The umami factor. Yeah, the savoriness, the meatiness of mushrooms. So that's why a portobello on a burger can be like a steak. It's because they're umami. Yeah, you need lunch. You're getting a little skinny here while you're interviewing. Yeah, so, um, so we, we use the, the glycation to get the umami factor out of the mushrooms. And then you can incorporate them into another dish, whether it's fajitas or a burger or in pasta or serving cold on a salad. What is this? Right here. This looks like a Well, this looks like it came out of some kind of archaeological site, like it's a skull or something. But this is a giant puffball, and I learned some really cool facts about the giant puffball right here at the Telluride Mushroom Festival last year. Puffball. Yeah, a mycologist named Tom Volk did a presentation on giant puffballs last year. And he said there's enough spores in this one puffball that if every single one of those spores became a puffball itself, that the earth would be about 30 feet deep in puffballs. It's a lot of puffballs. Yeah, just from the spores in this one puffball. So it's really amazing the intricacy and complexity. How heavy is it? What do you think? Yeah, it's kind of a small newborn. It's <laughs> yeah, maybe a newborn. Yeah.
And this is also um, a choice out of the mushroom. You can slice them really thin, and as long as it's nice and young, which is indicated by it should have a clear white like a marshmallow inside. If it's starting to yellow or brown in the middle, it's past its prime. The spores are too developed. You don't want to eat it then. Uh, but if it's white like a marshmallow, you can chop them up and bread them in panko and fry them, and they'd be like just the most delicious thing. Or I like to make them a little healthier, so I wrap them in olive oil and I bake them, and then I use them as a puffball pizza crust after I bake them a little bit to dehydrate it with the olive oil. I cover it with whatever pizza toppings I want, and I make a puffball pizza. That's an amazing imagination. Yeah, these are really fun. Very creative. And then this is what I made for dinner last night. So, like I said, our Illinois Mycological Association members are really great cooks, and we're all trying to outdo one another. So, last night, a gentleman named Mike Nealman took these hawksweight or sarcodon, and Hawksweight? Yes. And he made baunia cauda which is the national dish of the Piedmont region of Italy. It's a cream sauce made with anchovies. So he made hawk's wing banya cauda for dinner. And I can email you a photo of that if you'd like. If you'd like to share a photo or the recipe, I'm happy to send you that. Ooh, mama. Yeah, so this is a really choice edible. You are passionate about these mushrooms. I really am. And then um, this is a pile of aspen bolis, which um, is my second favorite bully in this area. I would pass these and leave my bag empty to save room for this. Is so this, this is Bolitas edgeless. This is really the fat of the land here and sort of what everyone is looking for. That's this like the Shaquille O'Neal of mushrooms. This is what in Europe they call the porcini and I think it's just absolutely iconic and beautiful. And I mean, it gets so heavy that one of these could just make a meal for so many people. And my very favorite year ever at the Telluride Mushroom Festival was, was 2010 because I picked my body weight in porcinis in three hours. Well, I'm not going to ask any specifics there, but congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for not. Yeah. You must be married. So polite. Thank you. Good. Yeah. She teaches well. Crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, um, you seem very passionate about it. Any suggestions for me when I go home? Because I'll probably pick the ones that are too long and feel like, what am I looking for while I'm out there picking? Is there a specific identification that I know is poison to stay away? Sure. My mushroom guru is a botanist named Gary Linkoff, and he told me something really important. You He's, know the mushroom guru? I do, I do. He said you can eat any mushroom once. So, if you can only eat it once, we don't want to eat that, because that means it's poisonous. So, you sh if you're not 100% sure about the species in hand, you don't want to eat it. I don't live in Colorado, so I'm not a complete expert on Colorado mushrooms. That means that I would consult someone like Linnea or someone like Bill if I found a species I wasn't 100% certain of. I would never take a guess. So, my best advice is, if you're not 100% certain, Get online and look up the Mycological Association in your state or city. They have walk-in and drop-by sessions with mycologists. In Chicago, we have an extraordinary relationship with the Field Museum of Natural History. And anyone in our state who has a mushroom that they can't identify can send photos of both the top and bottom so that the person, so that the mycologist can see the gill side. That's really important. This is really soft, the gill side. It is, yes. This, these are pores. This is a pored mushroom. It's very moist. But if someone were to just see the cap, we might not be able to ID it. So you can send a photo of the top and bottom to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, and our staff mycologist will identify it for you. Don't get fooled by the cap. Don't get fooled. And if you can't identify it by a photo, then you can actually send it into the museum, bring it into the museum. And so I just want people to know that there's a lot of resources for positive identification, and it's never okay to take a risk and eat a mushroom you're not sure of. Like that. Last question, Bill O'Reilly, you ever watch the show? I have, yes. Back in fan? Yes, I'm a fan. He's a charming. Charming? Char yes, yeah, so I like it. I've never heard that before. Yeah. 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 Bill, come out to uh, the mushroom parade. I'll help you make your costume. We have a session at the library that I'm bringing my six-year-old to, and she's uh, going to be a combination between Pocahontas and the mushroom, so I'm not sure how that will work. But the really great thing about the parade is one of my favorite things about the festival, there's a lot of people here who study cultivation or micro-remediation, which is healing the earth and the trees. My greatest interest is the anthropology of mushrooms, so how cultures throughout the world have a medicinal or a food relationship with mushrooms or in their art. I really love that. So what the parade is, is it's, don't just dress up as the mushrooms. We enact the mythology of all of those 
those different cultures. So the Siberians oh, yes. had mythology with the mushrooms. You'll see people with antlers, you know, dressed up as the Siberian reindeer shaman with the mushrooms. You'll see people dressed up as fairies. Yes, it is. Like it's just things like that. So it's really important to have some mushrooms in litter Thank you very much. My pleasure. Appreciate it. All right. Glad to know you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. much.